Welcome everyone to the NAB 2015 Themes 1.2 and Current Activity presentation. Um, I'm Loïc Barbou, the Managing Director of Fiscal. I also fulfill the role of uh, the Chair of the Themes Technical Board. And today we are going to uh, start with uh, the Themes 1.1 release, that is the uh, official release that is, that is available. The quick presentation about what's uh, included in Themes 1.2, and then we'll cover the other activities that uh, we have in Themes today. And we'll finish to present the next step uh, uh, for Themes, or basically what we have on the roadmap. Um, before we start diving into the details, I just want to present a little bit of information about the history of Themes. So FIMS was uh, created in 2009 uh, when EBU and AMWA joined forces and uh, created uh, a request for technology paper. Uh, from that, um, there's responses that came to that, to that paper. And oh, I was told to increase the sound here. So from that uh, RFT, uh, um, FIMS was created and uh, the first interface set of interfaces was released in 2011 that including the theme version 1.07 that included the transfer interface the transform interface and the capture interface um, important date for themes in uh, 2012 themes re was recognized by ibc and received the ibc innovation award in uh, 2014 uh, we released uh, the uh, version 1.1 of themes that included the repository interface as well as the race interfaces so what's next well this is what we're going to be covering in the in the next couple of slides okay a little bit of information about uh, who is involved in themes today um, the themes is divided in two big categories the first group is the themes business board um, that contains i'm sure you recognize some of the names uh, on the screen right now. Uh, the second board is the FIMS uh, technical board uh, that is much larger. Uh, one clarification, the FIMS business board is uh, reserved for media organization only. It is free for them to join. The FIMS technical board that has responsibilities of uh, really designing interfaces and creating the model. Um, vendors and organization can join. It is also free to join. A little bit more details about uh, now the subgroup within FIMS. Um, so I mentioned about the business board already. There's also a FIMS admin board that uh, controls uh, the direction of FIMS um, that is managed by mainly AMOR and EBU. Uh, the FIMS technical board is subdivided into uh, groups. Those groups represent the projects, the ongoing projects within FIMS. Um, as you can see, uh, right now we have five active, active groups. More subgroups will be created in the very near future based on the new projects that we want to spin off. One important um, number to note, uh, the FIMS technical board currently has 253 numbers. It's quite a lot. Yeah. So FIMS, um, for the one that haven't heard too much about them, so don't know exactly what FIMS really is. Um, just want to take a second to, uh, to talk a little bit about that. So what is, why FIMS? Okay. Well, there was a vision. The vision was really to create a set of plug and play interfaces that enable media system to integrate together in a much easier and simpler way. Okay. Um, at the end of the day, you know, spending a large majority, the spending the large majority of a budget on integrations instead of the product itself is not something that media organizations want to keep doing. It's one of the reasons why FIM uh, exists in the first place. Okay. So, how did we do that? Well, the concept that was initially created was heavily based on the fact that we need to define a way of the system to work together. And to do that, created a set of interfaces that represent the type of operations or media operation that are necessary to uh, exercise uh, the features of a given media product. So the approach that we've taken, or that we borrowed, because uh, we haven't really created anything new, 
we leverage technologies and concepts that has existed for quite a while in other verticals. So software-oriented architecture um, is something that fits very well uh, what we wanted to, to achieve within FIMS. Um, web services and exposing those web services through a set of SOAP of race interfaces also follow the model uh, that has worked in other places that we wanted to apply to media. Okay. One of the very important fundamental of media as well is how you represent media. And uh, we have spent, and we're still spending, a large amount of time in properly defining uh, that representation for media. And I'm going to be covering that in the, in the future slides. Okay. Um, in fact, uh, um, what is at the core of films is the media set representations. Okay. So when I say that we have spent a lot of time defining it, uh, um, we have been smart about it. And we've used you know, the best of breeds technology that, uh, that has been vetted and validated by a large media community. And to do that, uh, uh, we use a concept um, that was initiated uh, within uh, a standard that was created by EBU, that is EBU Core. That is also derivations of uh, Dublin Core. Okay. So let's, let's provide a little bit more details about what that is. Well, a film as cell representation is divided into different categories. It starts with the media container. The media container is the glue that holds all of the pieces together. But the media container is also the area of the asset that contains the identifiers for the asset itself. Then a film's asset also contains some descriptive metadata. Okay? Um, descriptive metadata, title, descriptions, uh, author, that created, you know, those type of things. Um, so within films, we agreed to define what the community could agree on. Obviously, um, many businesses have a different way of representing metadata, but they are commonality that we can, that was easy for uh, the group to, um, uh, to define as, you know, this is something that can be standardized. Uh, every asset has a title, every asset has a created date. So that's what is represented by the descriptive metadata. Then we have some technical metadata. So what is the technical metadata? Well, that's information that can be extracted from the media essences themselves that represent a, a format, a given format. So that's a codec, that's a resolution, that's a bit rate. And then we have the last layer that is what we, did, what we flag as being the media descriptor. So that's uh, an interesting concept, uh, because within films we disconnected the notion of is the, the notion of media asset and the notion of essences. Uh, the media descriptor is the linkage between uh, the asset and the essences. Uh, films support many types of essences. That can be as simple as a single file, a collection of files, a folder, or a complex structure, structure and that can be done within the media descriptor. On top of that, um, uh, we've also uh, added a concept of extensions. So uh, what comes out of the box with films uh, is definitely useful, but you can easily extend any of those pieces by following that concept. Okay. Uh, an example of a film asset. Um, some of the names that are listed on the slide here you may be fam very familiar with them, but they represent the name of the objects within films themselves. The first one is the BM content type. So that's at the highest level of the asset, and that represents the content itself. Okay. So that content has the ability to support multiple identifiers. Uh, as an example, your system may have some custom identifiers that gets created when you create an asset in it. Or you, or you may also need to support identifiers that are created within your organizations outside of that system. So FIM support that. It also support the ability to plug industry's IDs as identifiers for your asset. Uh, the next block represents uh, technical metadata, uh, I'm sorry, descriptive metadata. So that's what I touched base on on, on, the, on the last slide. Uh, those are some of the properties that exist within EBU Core that we could all agree on. It makes sense. There's no debate about the validity of those fields. You know, the title is a title, the description is a description. So we know that it's needed. Um, those fields are optional, you don't have to specify them, but if you 
if you need to specify them, there's a place for you to, uh, to hold the data. The second object that is listed there is the BM content format type. Um, a single asset within Teams has the ability to support multiple formats. What does that mean? It means that you can have uh, an asset that has an HDMXF that represents the mezzanine format. You can also have a proxy that is of lower bitrate uh, file, let's say an MPEG-4 file. Um, that, re that can be represented as a single asset within Teams. Okay? It's the same content. There's just two different formats that exist to represent that content. Uh, some inf some information about the technical metadata is listed on the on the BM content format type um, box on the screen right there. So you can see that there's some codec information, some uh, bitrate information, audio encoding. Uh, same thing. That information um, is derived from uh, direct is directly derived from EBU core. Okay. The last uh, layer of the film asset is what we call the essence locator. The essence locator is what describes the physical representations of the asset itself. In, the, in this particular instance, it is represented by a single MPEG-4 file. But it can be a collection of files, it can be a folder. Um, this is the reason why FIMS uh, has the ability to represent any type of asset. If there's a complex structure that needs to be represented, you can easily uh, create derivations of the BM essence locator types to fulfill your need. Okay. Uh, there's a one-to-many relationship between the BM content format types and the BM essence locator. What it means uh, that FIMS also has the ability to represent multiple locations for the same uh, instance of, a, of, a, of an essence. Uh, as an example, you may store that essence on your primary storage as well as your backup storage or your archive storage. Uh, all of that can be represented as a single FIMS asset. Okay? So at the end of the day, uh, you know, when you deal with FIMS asset, you deal with an object, and that object represents the content. And all of the properties about that content belongs to that object, all the way down to the locations of the essences themselves. Now, as I mentioned, there's an extension model within FIMS that is available that allows you to extend the metadata at any level of the, uh, the FIMS object. So why would we like to do that? Well. You know, based on, your cust on the needs of your organizations, you may need to carry some extra properties, either at the identifier level, uh, descriptive metadata, or even technical metadata, or maybe within your storage itself, you have, a, you have a specific way of representing your census, and you need to add more information to that. Okay? Uh, typically, uh, that information um, will need to be strongly typed and can be extended in many different, in, in two different ways within FIMS. And if you have to leverage that information within a given workflow, uh, you follow one of the extension model versus the other one. A lot of those topics actually are covered in uh, implementation guidelines that are also available as a serial webcast. Um, and wherever that video is going to be posted, and I believe on the FIMS YouTube channels, you will also be able to find more details about uh, the, webca the, the webcast that I'm mentioning. Okay. Very simple use case. Okay. Why uh, it is important to represent media as an object. So the, the scenario that we have here is a, a very simple scenario where information comes from a repository. We call it production repository. That, uh, object, that asset is now being transferred to a transcoding form. Uh, a new format is created. And the the, then the resulting asset is transferred to uh, the nearline repository. Within FIMS, um, we don't move files. We move objects. We deal with objects. Um, one important aspect of it is what comes out of a given service, a given interface, is what's being fed into the next one. So um, by doing such, we don't really lose information in translations. As you go into the step of the media workflow, you deal with the objects. You know, if you have to basically interact with the objects or interrogate some of the properties of the object, they're all there. If you have to, if you are the processing that you're doing on that object has some effect on the object itself in terms of metadata that gets updated, created, then you just add it to the object. Whatever you not in, whatever is there that you don't use, you don't remove it, but you pass it through. Okay? 
So what you end up with it, uh, as a big, uh, let me take the example of the transcode shape. You know, coming out of the transcode shape, you have a new format that is created. For an object point of view, there's a new BM content format and a new BM essence locator that is added to that, to that object. So when it gets stored to the repository, well, all the information is there. None of the service have deleted, removed, mangled uh, the op with, with the information available within the object itself. Okay? So there's no loss in translation. Something new um, within, within MediaWare, uh, if you use to deal with, uh, with the step of workflow, you deal with files and you don't deal with objects. Dealing with files, you totally lose, you totally lose control of the metadata or information coming out of a given service may not be reflected or may get lost as you go to the different step of the media workflow. Okay? So big plus in dealing with objects and not files through media workflow. Okay. So what exists today? Um, last year, at NAB 2014, we announced the release of Films 1.1. Uh, soon after NAB, um, the, the official package for, for Films 1.1 was released. Uh, new interfaces were created, and new things could be implemented within Pims. Let's take a look at that. Okay. So if you take, take an example of that workflow, let me just go to that quickly. So within that workflow, you encode some content. You could actually do that to the Pims capture service. Um, then you store that content, and you could use the Pims repository interface to do that. And you can transfer that content so use a transfer interface at reviews. Transcode, you can use a transform interface. Transfer it again to the same service. And you can now distribute that content. The distribution platform can also be abstracted by leveraging the film's repository interface. Each of those interfaces are available either as a SOAP interface or a REST interface. So all of that um, is possible with films 1.1. So where to get Films 1.1? Well, uh, there's a link posted on the, on the screen right here. Um, there's actually multiple locations where you can get that content, but that's one, uh, one of the best places to download it. Uh, the package includes several things that are quite important. Okay. So obviously, you have some documentation that explains the different type of interfaces. Um, you have an API uh, uh, specification of documentations that um, is interactive uh, that follows some of the uh, uh, some of the documentation that is available for um, state of the art API. Okay. So that's available within uh, within the package itself. We have a set of schema and a WSDL file uh, that represent uh, the WSDL represent the SOAP interface. The schema are shared across the REST and the WSDL uh, and the SOAP interface. And there's some sample implementations. Uh, one is so based and that is a fully functional uh, repository service that leverages uh, backend uh, some traditional IT storage uh, to store the content. There's also a REST, uh, uh, a simple REST interface uh, that describes how a FIMS uh, interface can be implemented following uh, the, REST, uh, the REST protocol. Okay? So all of that is available within the FIMS 1.1 package. Okay. Um, one thing to note, we, are, we have created a series of webcasts, and we're still working on those webcasts uh, uh, that describe the type of the, that describe the implementation guidelines of the FIMS 1.1. Uh, they especially focus around the repository interface. Okay. So FIMS 1.2. So what is FIMS 1.2? Okay. So let, let's, let's, uh, let's break down the FIMS 1.2 uh, into the list of projects uh, that have been running for the last couple of months and in some cases more than more than a year for the for the QA interface so let, let's let's take a look at that so the first one is the films quality analysis interface okay so where does it fit the best way to describe that is to uh, to uh, once again use a workflow for that so the workflow that uh, we covered uh, within the films 1.1 slide and we use that one and i in Included, I inserted a couple of steps in there. Those two steps, they will QC content. Uh, where can you QC content in your workflow? Where you can QC content anywhere, okay? Within the workflow that I described, it makes sense to do it in those two different uh, steps of the workflow, but you can pretty much do it at any step that you want. What does it mean to QC content? Well, let's take a look at it. Um, 
so QC in content is the ability to analyze the content and to make sure that whatever processing that you do in the content is up to a given standard or is good enough for for your uh, for your uh, media workflows in terms of the quality of the output that you need to generate. Yeah. So for the Films QA interface, uh, we actually define a series of operations that are specific to QA. But to define the type of uh, analysis that needed to be done, we leverage the work done by the EBU QC team. Okay. In fact, the EBU QC project uh, started pretty much at the same time than the, the Films QA project. Uh, what they've done is that they have created a series of uh, descrip description of tests that could be done that are represented as a series of cards that we call the EBUQC cards. Um, so those cards covers uh, audio analysis, uh, also covers you know, video analysis, um, even metadata, uh, some type of metadata validations around the asset. Uh, so there's a long list of cards. Well, within the FIMS QA interface, we have the ability to uh, leverage the EBUQC card in terms of defining uh, the list of EBUQC cards that you want to, uh, that represent the, 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 the profile of the actions, the processing that you want to do in a given asset um, within that, uh, that uh, analyze operations that you're doing through uh, the FIM interface. Okay. So the project at this point is 99% done. We have a little bit of wrapping up in terms of documentations. Uh, there's also some sample implementations that are in the works. So, okay. um, the design is 100% complete. Um, and as I said, at this point, it's pretty much, uh, wrap, we pretty much need to wrap everything and, uh, and release it as part of the, uh, uh, the FIMS 1.2 uh, package. Okay. So that's for the FIMS QA. Uh, one last, last note that I, that I want to make about the FIMS QA. A very, very large group of people have been involved with that project. Um, and we have created something that truly represents, from my point of view, um, something that the media, the media community really needs in terms of, one, uh, providing the required operations to analyze and QC content, and second, to uh, uh, provide also a list of uh, the required check or actions that can be done on any type of content, okay? So that's for the theme QA. The next project was a time code project, okay? I have one question. So the, the question is, does the repository service knows about FIMS QC? Um, it's totally independent. You know, if you are, look at the workflow that I presented earlier, the QC is just one step. So how is the, the let me go back to this, how is the output of uh, FIMS QC represented? Well, there's an output, there's a report that is present, that is, that the, 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 the FIMS uh, Q, uh, QA service will actually create. From that report, there's an interpretation that needs to be done if the content is good enough or if it needs to be further processed. If it's good enough, you will think that it could be stored within a repository. But those are independent steps of the media workflow. Uh, the extensions that have been created in order to, in order to, to, to support the new properties that have been uh, within the FIMS image model are also supported within the FIMS repository, obviously, as they share the same model. Yeah. So the time code project. Um, the best way to represent a time code project is also to, uh, to describe it through a media workflow, and is to describe it this way. Well, the time code project doesn't create new interfaces, but it provides the ability to do something that was not possible before within films, is to act on partial content. So what does that mean? Well, when it comes to um, uh, QCing content, I mean, you want to QC only a portion of that content only the first five minutes, only the last minutes, or just a set of frames. Well, you have the ability to now address um, partial content within any of the film's operations. So that, that's what it means for QA. In terms of the repository, if you have content that is stored within the repository, 
when you may want to retrieve an asset, but not the entire asset. It may be a very large asset, and you know that you only need to uh, um, to, look, to use a, a subset of a given instance, where you have the ability to do that, when you do a retrieve partial instance. Okay. Same thing for transfer. You need to transfer an asset from two different systems or across the globe. You know, if you know what you need, there's no need to have, if you know it exactly what you need within that asset itself, there's no need in moving the entire asset if only a couple of frames are required are needed. So you can actually do that. Within transcoding, and that's the type of service that I think that has a, where partial content has a bigger impact on the interface, there's many things that you can do. Uh, in terms of now transcoding a portion of an asset to do clip extraction, to do clip stitching. Um, there's also support for light EDL that is coming with FIMS 1.2. Uh, that doesn't mean that we have the ability yet to do to create a rendering service within FIMS, but you know we're not far from there. Uh, and we have we have again the the, trans, the transfer self, the transfer interface and the um, the repository interface of that. So that's the time code projects. Uh, the result of the work of the time code team, time code project team, has been uh, an extensive additions of types, object within the FIMS object model. Okay, So we haven't really changed what was there, but we added the ability to represent uh, content, frames, section of, a, of, a, of an asset within the FIMS object model itself. Okay, uh, And that's a platform that will allow us to support the type of operation that, is, that I described uh, on that slide, but will also allow us to grow in the future to um, create much more complex operations uh, that has to deal with partial content. So the project is completed. Um, let me go back to that. The project is completed. Sample implementation are also being created. But as far as I know, all the work that needs to be done uh, in order to release the uh, the FIMS 1.2 package has been done, has been completed for the FIMS 1, for the time code project. Okay. The next one is something that is totally different. It is known as the Service Capability Registry. So within FIMS 1.1, uh, uh, there was something called RCR. That was the Repository Capability Registry. That was a new concept in FIMS. Uh, what it was, uh, what it is, it's a way of describing how, an how the implementation of the interfaces was done and how it was configured. Um, the repository applications supports many operations. Some of those operations may not be, it may be possible for you to implement it. Okay. So that's why we created the RCR. We within the RCR, you can advertise that you have not implemented maybe the locking or the versioning operations of that interface. Um, what was created for the repository interface was extremely uh, specific to that interface. Uh, we had a need of expanding it and making that concept a bit more generic across all of the FIMS interfaces. And that's exactly what we've done. Instead of creating a brand new standard from scratch on how to do that, we actually leverage uh, something that uh, was created by SMT that is known as SMT ST2071-1 or MDCF. Okay. So we're leveraging that. Uh, we have created uh, already a model uh, that allow us to leverage that standard to describe the FIMS uh, um, capabilities uh, for the QA service. Okay. The FIMS 1.2 release, in fact, will contain um, a version of the service capability registry for the QA service. Uh, soon after that, uh, we will be releasing uh, the same model, the same the service capability registry for all of the other interfaces. Uh, the fact that uh, we're using a model that is very dynamic in terms of how we can define those capabilities, we do not have to release a new version of FIMS in order to release the service capability for the user interfaces. This is one of the reasons why we selected that approach as well. Okay. Okay. So now, the FIMS 1.2 release by itself. Is there something else that will come into it? Well. We received some feedback, actually. 
on the FIMS 1.1. And uh, for the implementers that have leveraged the FIMS 1.1 uh, REST interface for the repository interface, they, uh, uh, we, we found out that there was some mapping from that we've done from the SOAP operation to the REST operations that should be updated. So we've done that, and that will be included in the FIMS 1.2 as well. Time frame. Well, no, and I think that's what everyone is interested in. Well, it's coming. Okay, the design is completed. There's no uh, there's no surprises at this point. Um, technical technical specification and documentations are being finalized, um, and there's a, there's not a long there's not a long list of things to be done. At this point, the package is pretty much ready. Um, it's a question of days at this point. Uh, before we submit it to EBU and AMOA for validations, um, but we feel very confident that what we have in there uh, will actually be passing, will pass the validations and we won't have we need to go back and change anything. Okay. The sample implementation and implementation guidelines, so that's something that we're still working on. As you know, documentation is something that really nobody wants to work on, but we're trying to find creative ways of, uh, of doing this. So. And the last thing, if there's one thing that you that you need to remember on the FIMS 1.2 is, it is ready. The pre-validation package um, will be available in the next couple in the next um, uh, couple of days. Okay. One of the reason why one of the reason why we did not release it ahead of NAB, a lot of people are very very busy before NAB in preparations, and we did, we wanted to make sure that we're not going too fast and release something that will require a lot of work and back and forth. So uh, I expect that in the next couple of days, um, EBU and AMOA will receive the package and can start the validation. Okay. FIMS other activities, and there's quite a bit of them. Okay. So let's start with uh, a project that is uh, also very active. Um, that is the FIMS Automated Metadata Extractions, or what we call FIMS AME. So that project um, is uh, uh, for an interface that is not extremely far from the FIMS QA, but the output of that type of service may be quite different. Where well, you don't check if the asset is up to a certain quality, but you extract information from it. So what does that mean to extract information? It can be in terms of technical metadata, it can be around uh, semantic information around the asset itself, or it can be interpreting the content and extracting that information up to face detections, scene detections, um, you know, and all of the above. There's actually a project that's called the Sky Project that uh, was initiated uh, by the EBU that is that has some, some similarity with the EBU QC, uh, where that project uh, has for goal to define a set of profiles for the type of metadata extraction that can be done on a given asset. So we're actually trying to align the work that we're doing on defining the operations within FIMS AME with the work being done by the, by the SCAL projects. So far, it's working very well. Uh, we are taking the lessons learned from the work that we've done with EBU QC, and we're reusing what worked well. So in terms of the EBU, the EBU QC code, we're, creating the, we're going to be using the same type of, of thing within EBU that will describe the type of metadata extraction that can be done on a given asset and store them as code. Yeah. Um, so we're still in designs. There's some primary concepts that, uh, that are being reviewed right now. Um, the plan is to release the FIMS AME as part of FIMS 1.3. So when will that be? Um, I mean, I cannot give you an exact date, but uh, I don't expect, or I expect that the FIMS AME will, talk, uh, will take a lot less time than the FIMS QA. Yeah. Other activities. The next one that we're working on is the implementation guidelines. Um, so that, that's an activity that uh, is taking a bit of time. Um, it may be a bit painful to do, but we feel that it's very necessary to uh, create uh, that type of information. So in a nutshell, the implementation guideline is your YouTube do-it-yourself type of video. So if you are, uh, and first they will focus on the repository interface. So 
if you decide to implement the repository interface, um, and there's many different ways of doing this, depending on what you're trying to abstract, if it's a storage, if it's a MAM system, if it's a post-production system, well, there's things that you need to know about. Uh, and instead of boring everyone by creating very long documents, no, we're working on creating those webcasts. Some of them are already available, some of them are in the works, and there's a list of them where we have not really started to do too much work on it, or that we have not started to do too much work on them yet. Um, the, a large chunk of those webcasts will be released right after NAB. So if you connect to the themes YouTube channels, you should be able to find them there. The next one is the theme test framework. Um, something that people are very, very excited about it. We're getting to the point where, well, there are systems that are themes compliant that are available. So how do you know that they're themes compliant? And how do you know if the implementation is actually working the way it should? So that's the idea behind the themes test framework. Okay. Um, so there's really two type of um, consumer for that, uh, for the for the informations that will be created by the FIMS test framework team. One is the implementers. I mean, many organizations. I basically um, want to interact with product that are FIMS compliant. How do I know that the information that I pass into the service is actually uh, compliant with FIMS? Well, we'll provide that information, and there's a set of um, uh, uh, objects, sample payload that will be available that will help you in, the, in making sure that it, what you do is compliant to the way uh, the operations have been defined for that given interface, obviously. Um, the second scenario is I'm a vendor, and I'm implemented themes, but I don't know if my system is working the way it should. Well, same thing. You know, we're going to probably be providing some information that enables those vendors to test their implementations. Okay? Um, to do so, uh, we will create different things that will come in forms of maybe simple implementations that you can use to exercise service operations, uh, services that are hosted maybe in the cloud that people can consume to test their, their payload, their things payload, and pretty much everything in between. Okay? So um, we are spinning off a new group within Themes that will be focusing solely on that. Um, if any of you is interested in joining, raise your hand. Okay. I will actually be covering that in the last slide. If you need to, if you're interested in joining any of those projects, uh, it is very the, re the research process is extremely simple. Okay. The next one is something that uh, we describe as the Themes Developer Community. So, what is that? Well. There's many type of contribu contributions that you can do to firms. Okay. Um, you can join a project team. You can work on uh, within a, within one of those project team, and you can uh, be part of the designs of those interfaces. Um, if you uh, the other way of, of contributing is, you know, you may have implemented something within firms, um, a utility, an interface, or an extensions that uh, you think people can benefit from. Well, the channel to do that will be the Themes Developer Community. Well, you, have a you will have a place to post that information that will be reviewed by, uh, by a group within Themes, and you will receive feedback on it in terms of uh, if it's something that is really aligned with the Themes way of life, or if it's something that is totally different and you know, doesn't really make sense to live within uh, uh, within the FIMS uh, developer community. So how is that represented? Well, we already have created a GitHub for FIMS. There's two of them. There's one that is private, and there's one that is public. Uh, the private one right now is accessible by anyone who's a member of FIMS. Once again, it's free to join FIMS. Um, but as part of working uh, within the project team, you have access to all of the work in progress. Okay? And that's stored within the private GitHub. The public GitHub contains all of the official releases, and I think will also contain uh, um, the, the, the channel for anyone to contribute to upload um, 
their uh, application utility interface or extensions uh, that uh, that extend things that support things okay. so the open source community will also be uh, will also grow a lot with uh, i mean post nab so far it's something that has been uh, validated more by the internal team and we are going to be uh, uh, talking a lot about that and, 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 and market the, the themes uh, developer community in the next couple of weeks. The next one is the repository interface advanced operations. So there's still a project team that, that represents the repository uh, team or the rep team and that is working on the implementation guidelines. Well, we're starting the next version of the repository implemented the, the repository interface uh, and that's based on requests that we've received one from the business board and second from the individual that have already implemented the repository interface uh, the, ver the first version that we created for that interface uh, has the ability to do all of the CRUD operation on object and essences um, one thing that uh, it couldn't do was to deal with relationship between assets. And that's something that we want to add in the next versions of that repository. Uh, another thing that was important based on the feedback that we received is the ability for that interface to handle uh, objects that may not be managed by that given repository. As an example, you may have a file that lives somewhere uh, externally to your, to your, let's say, to your MAM system that you don't control that essence, but your MAM system needs to know that is available somewhere, even if you cannot act upon it. Yeah. So we'll be adding that, adding that as well. Um, the next, the, the last features is what we call the asset grouping, is really the ability to uh, tag informations um, and create uh, groups of, uh, of content in order to uh, enable more powerful queries and search of the content. The next one is on semantic metadata. So what is that? Yeah. So I, can, I could spend an hour talking about semantic metadata or even longer than that. And there's even people that are sitting in front of me right now that are even uh, expert in that, in that area. But at the end of the day, you know, we know that what we have, to, what we have defined within themes, I know it's good, I would have to say it's very good, but there's always ways to make it better. And having the ability to uh, define schemas of schemas, and that's what semantic metadata is about, and some of the concepts that, uh, that have been available within the web semantic and apply that to media, I think could be a great way of expanding the reach of themes in terms of how we represent content. So there's definitely some brainstorming that, is happen that needs to happen in that space. Uh, and that's, that's basically what we'll be doing uh, so very soon. Uh, what will come out of that? Well, I'm not sure, but if you want to be part of it, um, you have to be a member of FIMS, and you can uh, be part of the discussions around you know, FIMS semantic metadata and what does it mean for media. The next one is FIMS and growing content. Well, you know as well as I do that, uh, speed of the workflow that we have is never fast enough and uh, doing operations uh, as soon as we can is something that is very important. So starting to uh, create a proxy while a file is ingesting, doing clip extractions on a file that is being ingested, you know, those are all of the use cases that, the, those are all the use cases that media organizations are facing today. Within FIMS, uh, you know, we do not have the ability to act on growing content. The file has to be there in order to go to the next step. So we're looking at also enabling themes to, uh, um, to orchestrate operations on content that is growing. That can be coming out of an encoder, that can be coming out of a transcoding, um, or an ingest. Okay. So same thing. This is something that requires some brainstorming. Okay. We, during our last sessions, where the technical board, the last technical board meeting back in January, uh, we started at brainstorming. It went very, very well. 
we just we just need to go to the next step now and formalize that and go to the to a bit more details in terms of what does it mean to truly define growing to process growing content within films and um, create dependencies on the existing interfaces. Okay. Um, from there, I suspect that there's a new project group that will be created that will be solely working on that. And the next one is something that uh, we have flagged as thing as a foundation standard, and it is a, a brand new concept. It is uh, uh, something that was also discussed during our last uh, technical board meeting, but it's really the ability to define within themes uh, standardized ways of building extensions. So this, the, that project will be very well aligned with the one with by enabling the FIMS um, open source community, uh, where the way you could extend FIMS to embed another standard into it and communicate with other standards um, could be defined within a FIMS project group, or could totally be defined by anyone who's in net integrations and wants to provide that as a known um, uh, set of schemas or uh, a model that anyone can use and they can provide that to the FIMS open source community. Uh, right now, I just want to make a statement that if you need to do a translation, let's say, of an IMF payload into a FIMS payload, well, you have several ways of doing it. It is possible, I've done it, but there's interpretations and you have to make some choices. So creating that concept of you know, building themes as a, as a foundation standard, where now the type of extension that you can build and, and uh, where you build them and where you inject that within themes, uh, if they're standardized well, that means there would be one way of doing it. And that means that you know, whoever is working on that can create a, a solution that would be truly interoperable that can be leveraged by other people. So. Um, it's also something that requires a bit of brainstorming. We have started, we have started to peel the onion during our last sessions. Uh, there's a bit more digging that has to be done. Um, and it's probably something that also requires a large amount of feedback from, uh, from the members of the FIMS Technical Board. That's where we stand today. Okay. So more to follow uh, on this one after we release the FIMS uh, 1.2 release. And if you wonder why it isn't Apple on that slide right here, well, attend the next FIMS technical board meeting. Now more information about FIMS. There's a couple of places uh, where you can go and either get information about uh, the technical side of FIMS, and that will be in the FIMS wiki. The FIMS.tv um, will con contains information more on the marketing and general information about the logistic of FIMS itself. Um, you can always email the FIMS uh, admin group or email me directly if you have specific questions. Um, now last but not least, if you need to join FIMS, as I said, or join one of those projects, it's actually very simple. Okay? You uh, can email the admin board. Um, you can email any of the uh, individuals that are members of the admin board, um, and they can help you in one, becoming a FIM member if you're not a FIM member. A second, uh, makes you part of a given project if you're already a FIM member. Okay. Thank you for attending the presentation. <laughs>